Hi, this is Tom, and in this video, I'm going to be going through normal sinus rhythm. And you can find written notes on this topic at zerotofinals.com slash sinus rhythm or in the data interpretation section of the Zero to Finals More Medicine book. And you can find flashcards and questions to train your knowledge and help you remember the information for longer at members.zerotofinals.com. So let's jump straight in. Sinus rhythm is seen on an ECG when the electrical system in the heart is functioning normally. It involves a regular heart rate between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Each beat is represented by a P wave, QRS complex and T wave. And in this video, we're going to go into detail on all of these features of the ECG. Let's start with some basic physiology. The heart has four chambers. Blood from the body drains from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava into the right atrium which pumps blood into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs. Blood that's returning from the lungs carrying oxygen drains into the left atrium, which pumps blood into the left ventricle. The left ventricle pumps blood to the body. The pumping action of the heart is coordinated by organised electrical activity. Normally, the electrical activity of the heart starts in the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node is the heart's natural pacemaker and it dictates when the heart beats. It's located at the junction between the superior vena cava and the right atrium. The electrical signal travels through the right atrium and to the left atrium via Bachmann's bundle. The electrical activity causes the myocytes, which are the muscle cells, in the atria to contract, squeezing blood into the ventricles. The electrical activity travels through the atrioventricular node or AV node which is the electrical pathway between the atria and the ventricles. It passes from the AV node to the bundle of His which splits into the right bundle taking the signal to the right ventricle and the left bundle taking the signal to the left ventricle. From here it passes to the Purkinje fibres, which take the electrical signal throughout the ventricles, causing them to contract. The right ventricle pumps blood to the pulmonary arteries and the lungs, and the left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta and to the body. Let's talk about depolarization and repolarization. The cardiac action potential refers to the change in electrical charge across the cell membrane of the myocytes or the heart muscle cells that stimulates the heart muscle to contract. There are two essential parts depolarization which leads to the muscle contracting and repolarization which is where the cells relax and reset ready for the next contraction repolarization is like the recovery period the inside of the myocyte cell is negatively charged compared to the outside 
The membrane potential refers to the difference in charge between one side of the membrane and the other. The normal resting membrane potential when the myocytes are not contracting is minus 70 millivolts. The electrical signals trigger the movement of ions, particularly sodium and calcium which are both positively charged, into the cell causing the membrane potential to go from negative to positive. It goes from minus 70 millivolts to plus 30 millivolts. This is called depolarization and it triggers muscle contraction. Following depolarization, there is a period of repolarization. Repolarization is where the myocytes or the muscle cells reset back to their resting state, ready for another depolarization. The muscle is relaxed, and potassium and calcium ions, which are both positively charged, are transported across the cell membrane to reset the membrane potential back to baseline. Let's talk about lead 2 and the heart axis. A standard 12 lead ECG is produced by recording the electrical signals from 10 electrodes placed across the body. One electrode is placed on each limb and six electrodes are placed across the chest. Lead 2 is usually the optimal lead for assessing the heart rhythm. Lead 2 is a bipolar lead, meaning that it represents the electrical changes in the space between two electrodes. One electrode is placed on the right arm and this is the negative electrode, and the other electrode is placed on the left leg, which is the positive electrode. The right arm connects to the body at the right shoulder, and the left leg connects to the body at the left hip. Therefore, lead 2 shows the electrical changes in the space between the right shoulder and the left hip. This is considered to be at 60 degrees across the body, where 0 degrees is horizontal from the person's right to left, and 90 degrees is directly vertical from head to feet. Lead 2 aligns with the axis of the heart in most people. The axis of the heart is the overall direction that electrical activity flows through the heart, from the sinoatrial node down to the ventricles. Imagine standing on the sinoatrial node and looking in the direction of travel of the electrical activity. The normal heart axis is somewhere between minus 30 and plus 90 degrees. Next let's talk about the ECG waves. In lead 2 there are some key features of normal sinus rhythm. The baseline or isoelectric line which represents the resting membrane potential when the myocytes are not contracting or conducting new electricity. P waves which represent atrial depolarization. QRS complexes, which represent ventricular depolarization, and T waves, which represent ventricular repolarization. The sinoatrial node creates an electrical impulse that travels through the atria, causing depolarization of the atrial myocytes or muscle cells. This activity moves from the sinoatrial node through the atria 
roughly in the direction of lead 2, in the same direction as from the right shoulder to the left hip. And it's seen as a positive upstroke on the ECG. Once the movement of electrical activity through the atria is complete, the ECG line returns to baseline. This bump is the P wave, representing the electrical impulse moving through the atria, and this causes atrial contraction. The Q wave is either not visible or small on lead 2. It is a negative deflection at the start of the QRS complex. It represents the electrical impulse travelling from left to right in the interventricular septum, the muscular wall between the ventricles. As this is roughly at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the direction of lead 2, it doesn't usually show up on lead 2. The electrical activity that shows up is when the impulse is moving further away or closer to one of the electrodes on lead 2. With the Q wave, the electrical impulse is moving across but not closer or further away from either of the electrodes in lead 2. So it doesn't appear as a significant difference from the baseline. The R wave represents the electrical impulse travelling down to the apex or the tip of the heart and the main depolarization of the ventricles. This is in the same direction as lead 2, from the right shoulder to the left hip. So it appears as a positive upstroke. The R wave is typically the largest part of the QRS complex. The S wave represents the later stages of ventricular depolarization after the electrical impulse reaches the apex and is traveling away from the apex. This is in the complete opposite direction of lead 2, traveling overall from the left hip towards the right shoulder, so it appears as a negative downstroke. The T wave represents the repolarization of the ventricles. Repolarization is where ions are moved across the cell membrane to reset the cells back to their baseline membrane potential. This involves a negative charge spreading from the outside or the epicardium towards the inside or endocardium of the ventricles in the opposite direction of lead 2. As this is a negative charge spreading in the opposite direction of lead 2, it creates a positive upstroke on the ECG trace. Finally, let's talk about the normal durations. A standard ECG is recorded at 25 mm per second. The paper travels through the printer at 25 mm every second, meaning that a section measuring 25 mm on the paper is equivalent to one second of heart activity. You can use the grid to assess the pace. Small squares are equal to 0.04 seconds or 40 milliseconds. Large squares are equal to 0.2 seconds or 200 milliseconds. One second is equal to five large squares or 25 small squares. The PR interval is from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex. It normally lasts less than 0.12 to 
to 0.2 seconds or 120 to 200 milliseconds or 3 to 5 small squares. It represents the time it takes for the electrical activity to travel from the atria to the ventricles. A prolonged PR interval represents delayed conduction through the atrioventricular node. This occurs in heart block. The QRS duration is from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the QRS complex. It normally lasts less than 0.12 seconds or 120 milliseconds or three small squares. The QRS duration represents the time it takes for electrical activity to spread and depolarization to occur in the ventricles. A prolonged QRS duration occurs in bundle branch block, which is where the left bundle branch or the right bundle branch has delayed or blocked conduction. The QT interval is from the start of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. This represents the time it takes for depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. The QT interval is shorter at faster heart rates. The corrected QT interval, or QTC, estimates the QT interval if the heart rate were 60 beats per minute. A prolonged QT interval represents prolonged repolarization of the heart muscle cells or myocytes after a depolarization and contraction. The QTC is prolonged at more than 440 milliseconds in men and more than 460 milliseconds in women. Prolonged QT interval increases the risk of ventricular arrhythmias, particularly torsade de pointe. Now head over to members.zerodefinals.com to test yourself on how much you understood and remembered from this video. The member's site contains illustrated flashcards, multiple choice questions, and short answer questions designed to perfectly complement the Zero to Finals resources. It also features an Anki-like fact trainer tool which you can use to train your knowledge on the key facts you need for your medical exams. You test yourself on the fact, then rate how difficult you found that fact. The site then spaces out your repetitions and tells you when you're due to review it again. Going over the facts with space repetitions helps ensure they stay in your long-term memory. A link to the member site is in the video description.